Good evening. My name is Maine Castillo. On behalf of the rest of the staff at Town Hall and our friends at Elliott Bay Book mm -hmm. Company, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation with Senator Maisie Hirono and Professor Viet Ben Nguyen as a part of our civic series. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Senator Hirono and Professor Wen for appearing to help make that possible. If you share in Town Hall's vision of a, for a robust community engaged in the arts, science and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider donating tonight or becoming a member. Town Hall is adding new programs every day. Upcoming events include Wayne Horowitz, Aisha Brooks, and Ha Yang Kim. Take the stage in our series with Earshot Jazz, and that is happening later today. Our science series with graduate students from the University of Washington continues with talks on brain surgery lasers, protein movies, and essential jellyfish. And Kate Arnoff is joined by Bill McKibben to discuss how capitalism has ruined the planet and what we can do about it. Oh, you can okay. check out more of what's upcoming by visiting our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Tonight's conversation will be about 60 minutes, including Q&A. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom of the video player, so please submit those at any time. You can also text questions to 206-504-2857, as noted in the chat. We cannot guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. For those who would like to view the program, please, uh, for those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for rewatching immediately following the event. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Networks Foundation, True Brown Foundation, KUOW, the Northcliffe Foundation, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. One final note, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight, please use the link in the chat below to buy through our partner bookseller, Elliott Bay Book Company. Senator Maisie K. Hirono is a graduate of the University of Hawaii Manoa and the Georgetown University Law Center. She served in the Hawaii House of Representatives from 1981 to 1994, then as Hawaii's Lieutenant Governor from 1994 to 2002, and then the, the U.S. House of Representatives from 2006 to 2013. She became Hawaii's first female and first Asian American Senator in 2013, winning re-election in 2018. Hirono serves on the Committee on the Judiciary, the Committee on Armed Services, and the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, among others. Viet Thanh Nguyen is a, un a university professor and the Errol Arnold Chair of English and the Professor of English American Studies and Ethnicity and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. His novel, The Sympathizer, won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, and numerous other awards. His most recent publication, Out Just This March, is a sequel to The Sympathizer, The Committed. A few of his other books include a short story collection, The Refugees from 2017, and Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War from 2016. Senator Hirono's memoir, Heart of Fire, An Immigrant Daughter's Story, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Viet Thanh Nguyen and Senator Maisie Hirono. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Megan. <laughs> uh, Senator Hirono, it's such a, such a pleasure to be here with you, but, you know, and also to, with the audience in Seattle. I, of course, I wish I was there with you in Seattle, my, my uh, second or third favorite city in the United States, I think. I uh, love the, uh, um, the bookstore, by the way, in Seattle, mm -hmm. really. Well, it's it's fantastic, great. of course. Seattle's you know redeemed by its book loving culture. Uh, hey, by the way, I just want to tell the audience we did not color coordinate in advance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's also a very positive sign. I think so. In the same clothes, <laughs> Senator Rona, such an honor to be here with you. Um, as I was telling Likewise. you in the green room. I, I wouldn't do this for just any politician. Um, <laughs> uh, certainly heard about your reputation well in advance of getting the invitation to read your book, which is really, you know, fabulous, by the way. Um, really well written. And we'll get to all of that as well. And of course, okay. I learned a lot about you in terms of your life story, uh, not just your politics and your rise as a, as a politician, but also a, a lot about you as a person as well. 
And, you know, backstage, we were, we were talking about the art behind you and that one of the things I discovered about you is, you know, besides being a politician, you, you are actually a lover of the arts in various yes. ways, literature, yes. visual art, and you have a hobby that I thought was really interesting. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this hobby that you have. I make my own paper and make my cards. Um, I've always loved anything artisanal. So paper making is uh, that. And so I used to go around buying all these handmade paper <laughs> and I thought, I'm just gonna start making my own paper to just keep myself on an even keel in DC with all the ups and downs and craziness here. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really cool um and you know hopefully one day i will be the recipient of such a card i'm sure it's a it's give a, me your address and i will get it to you <laughs> oh, dude, it's a big deal to get a card from senator hirono um, uh and, and and then of course as as a as a, as a writer and a, and a lover of literature it was also you know redeeming for me to to read your memoir and to discover that you were a big reader as a as mm -hmm. a child and that thankfully some of your teachers encouraged you so let's go to those early years. Um, every superhero has an origin story. Uh, and if Senator Hirono is a superhero in, in this day and age, I'd, like, I'd love for the audience to hear more about your origin story, you know, uh, how you came to be and how you came to be in uh, Hawaii and the United States, because it's really, it's really fascinating and, and, and uh, you know, touching, but also powerful as well. The book is dedicated to my mom, Laura Hirono, who was a very courageous risk taker and she totally changed my life by bringing me to this country. And not very many people can say that one person totally changed their life, but mom did that for me and she escaped a, an abusive marriage to a father I never got to know because I lived away from him and was raised by my grandparents, maternal grandparents from the age of three till just before we came to Hawaii. I have a very different kind of a background than um, most of my classmates I'd say. No, absolutely. And there's so many strands of the family story that are, again, powerful and, and touching. And, and they shaped who you are and, and, and as a person, but also as, as a politician. So I think it's important to, to find out some, some more details uh, yes. about that. Um, well, you know, one thing that happened in your family story uh, is that you had a brother, Wayne, and he was, actually, he, he was your younger brother, and he had to be left behind, right? When, yes. when, when, you, when your mom decided to come to the United States or to come to when Hawaii. We came, when we came to this country, she brought the two older kids because we were old enough to go to school and my baby brother was only three. There'd be nobody in this country in Hawaii to take care of him while my mother worked to support us. And so she sadly had to leave him in the care of the same grandparents who raised me. But we did not know that that separation trauma would be with him for his entire uh, sadly short life and it stayed with them. And, and that is why I, uh, when, when Trump imposes his mindless cruelty by separating children from their parents, I knew the kind of damage that we were doing the, and the injury we were doing to these little kids. That part of your story really touched me because when I came to the United States as a refugee at four, and, you know, we were in a refugee camp in the States and in order to leave, we had to have sponsors and yes. no would take our, our entire family. So at four years of age, I was separated from my parents and sent to live with other, uh, with Americans. And that was for the our own benefit, obviously, not malevolent. And yet I've never forgotten that experience. So I can just imagine yes. how, how difficult it would have been for Wayne for to be separated for even much longer period of time and, and not even be able to see. Yes. See or, uh, or and, and that was the really sad part because my mother, of course, we didn't realize that it would cause that kind of trauma and leading to uh, learning disabilities and, and all kinds of other challenges that he had in his life. That's, I attribute so much of that to the separation. Um, but to know that he would look at our pictures every night and ask my grandmother, when are we coming home? That just kind of breaks your heart. It does. It does. I mean, and we'll talk about the politics later, because, of course, there's a direct connection to thinking about what our own policies do in terms of family separation and children mm -hmm. detention and, and all of these kinds of tragedies that we have seen unfolding and, 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 and which are still happening uh, today as well, even with uh, presumably the best intentions of the Biden administration. Yes. Then your family gets to Hawaii, your mother and, and, uh, and yourself and your, uh, your, your brother, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not an easy start to, no. <laughs> to this new life uh, with a single mother and two young children, because you're eight and your brother is at what age? Nine. Nine. Oh, he's, a, he's almost, he's nine. 
So, yes, we uh, we started off in a single room in a boarding house. And uh, if, any, if you know about boarding houses, literally this is one room, you know, um, apartments. And then you there was a hallway and you'd have this kitchen area. It wasn't even a kitchen. It was just kitchen area. And we all shared a, a bathroom. And uh, it was a pretty humble beginning. So I knew we didn't have much. Um, none of my classmates were ever invited to our little one room place where we had one bed and literally we slept sideways. But it, that wasn't all. And what stayed with me was uh, how hard my mom had to work to, to take care of us. We didn't know anything about a social safety net. <laughs> What's that? And we didn't have uh, uh, free lunch programs back then. And, and so uh, my mother really worked hard. And, you know, the, this experience that by the end of the month, we're running out of uh, money. And, and throughout, I, I remember just eating really simply. <laughs> One hot dog, you know, that was fine. Right. So. Uh, I learned not to complain though, because watching a parent work that hard, you know, you're not going to be a brat about it. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, yeah, we know but, some brats, but um, yeah. okay. <laughs> I yeah. wasn't one of them. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know, in my experience it was like that too, you know, watch, you know, coming as a refugee, watching my parents just work constantly. Yeah. And that would have, you know, have an impact on the family life as well. But your, your circumstances were also really in, even more difficult than, than you're, you're, you're saying at this moment, because part of what happened is that your mother then was finally able to bring your, mm-hmm. her parents, your grandparents to Hawaii, along with, with Wayne at that time. Right. Yes. And then, you, the only way she could afford to keep everybody together was to agree to, to, to ba- basically make you all f- farmers for yes. this, this fam, this farmer. Yeah, for, the, for the family that sponsored my grandparents, they wouldn't have been able to come. My mother was not in a position to sponsor her parents. And so um, they, these were so-called old friends from the, from the time that my grandparents were at the sugar plantations and they left to, to go to Japan when my mom was 15, but th- they had a flower farm and there we all were. <laughs> like the, I call that my grapes of wrath period. <laughs> right. I mean, you got to live there for free in this sort of. one room cottage or something or shack or something. Well, like. it, it had maybe more than one, but it was really dark, unpainted and uh, it, it was real country back then. <laughs> yeah. and, and so transportation was a, a long ways away. Yeah. One bus, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Well, also, you didn't get paid. I mean, when I said free in quotation marks, it was you got to stay there for free, but in exchange, you had to do all this work for this for this flower farm. My grandparents, you know, my grandparents. grandmother worked for free, yeah. and so, boy, that was uh, that was an expensive rent, I have to say. And that that wasn't the worst of it. It really you felt really subjugated by under the thumb yeah. of the person I call Old Man Okabe. And he was uh, not a particularly welcoming, pleasant person. He would yell at us if we were too noisy. So this is part of the contours of the origin story that I'm thinking of coming as as an immigrant with a single mother, you know, with a separated family, without much in terms of of wealth or health insurance or anything like that. And then obviously living in these conditions on this this flower farm, I'm sure has shaped you in very fundamental ways. Yes. Uh, I mean, do, do you still think about that? That time period that oh was- of course you know what I I, I I never forget where I come from or who I fight for and why I wouldn't even be in politics if I had a kind of a usual middle class sort of conformist uh, upbringing um, no I, I would were enough for my immigrant background and the fact that I had a mom who took risks and uh, who never asked me even once when I was going to get married and when I was going to have children. Can you imagine at a time when I'm older than you, but back then women were supposed to, if we go to college, you're supposed to get married and have children. And that's kind of it. Right. No, my mother never talked about that. And, and one of my good friends says she can't be my real mother because real mothers are supposed to drive you crazy. <laughs> and my mother was very supportive of all the unusual things that I did that broadened my experiences and horizons. Right. Well, your mother had a very unfortunate experience with your yes. biological father who did not, who was not a very good person. Yes. You know, from, from, In yeah. fact, she told me when I asked her, why doesn't she bug me about those things? She said she ruined her life by getting married to my father. She said, why should I tell you what to do? <laughs> well, she learned the right lesson from that experience, I think. Versus saying- she took control of her life. That's the thing you see, because women in Japan do not run away from their 
their in-laws and you know she had to she was living with the in-laws they treated her like a slave yeah. or, or the husband and if they run away they do it themselves they certainly don't take the children with them mm -hmm. Yeah, so then here you are, you, you are now in your adolescence and you go to uh, university in Hawaii. And this is a very transformative moment for you again, I yes. think, uh, because obviously you get access to this whole new world and, and, and you start to become involved in politics at this time, is that right? I made a decision that I would go work in a community called Waimanalo, which uh, uh, was considered a economically distressed area with a lot of Native Hawaiian young people. And so I was part of a group of 10 University of Hawaii students hired to go over there, go to Waimanalo and create a teen center. And now I thought I had kind of a simple, you know, uh, upbringing, but I, I really entered a whole different culture in Waimanalo. Uh, and it was, it was really uh, broadening and I, I have very fond memories of Waimanalo and I, you know, do my best to um, respond to their needs and all of that. But it, it was in that time when all the other nine university students had all gotten arrested uh, protesting the war, except for me. <laughs> so there was some concern that I wouldn't fit in. But one of my best friends in that experience uh, was roommates with one of the local anti-war activists in Hawaii. And, and there weren't very many local leaders of the anti-war protests. Most of the leaders were from the mainland, but um, this person was one of them. His name is David Hagino, and he decides that he's going to run for office in 1970. Mm -hmm. And um, he was ahead of his time because he also decided that it had to be a woman to run his campaign, and that was me. I had never done any campaigning before, but that is the first experience I had. And and as we say in Hawaii and I busted my okole trying to get this guy elected. <laughs> well, obviously that sent you down a path of, of a lifelong involvement in politics in one way or another, but I'm just kind of fascinated by this part of the origin story because I was a college activist, uh, but I did not go into electoral politics. I just didn't <laughs> like that part of it. So <laughs> what was it about this experience of being, you know, managing this campaign, seeing these electoral politics taking place? What was it that turned you on? to that part of, of political life? I, I was quite idealistic as a lot of the anti-war activists were. And I began, I looked at politics as a way to make social changes. Uh, but at that time, it's not as though the women were encouraged to run for office. Uh, I had worked on uh, three other campaigns before I decided that I needed more credentials as a woman in the political arena. And so I went off to law school after getting my BA five years later. Uh, and, I, and, and that is such a typical kind of a situation for women of my generation. Low expectations. Nobody encourages you to do anything that's different or sort of, you know, out there. But um, one of the people that I had campaigned for said, I'm not going to run for re-election. And you've been encouraging all of the young people, all of us, to run for office. So why don't you do it? And so um, my younger brother had passed away and I was living with my mother to be with my mom. Uh, but uh, I decided to move to this district that I could run from because I said, Mom, where we were living at that point was sort of a middle class area at that point. I said, you know, the biggest concern is traffic. I want to represent people who have more than than those concerns, I mean, the economic issues and all that. So I moved out. And I, I, I think that if it had been for any other reason, my mother would have been very um, hurt. But when I told her I'm going to move on and she asked me why, I said, because I'm going to run for office. And she just said, oh, <laughs> and that was it. You know, she was just totally always on the page with me. Mm -hmm. So th that's really what happened. I, I did not plan to run for office myself. A lot of women don't. It takes encouragement for us to run for office. And the good thing is we that there are a lot of women now and minority people who don't wait around to be asked. They go for it. And I'm really glad, especially in the U.S. House. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the themes in your book is men mm -hmm. and the lack of support <laughs> that, or, or worse that you receive from men, of course, as you're, as you're saying right now, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of old boys network stuff mm -hmm. happening um, when, when, when established politicians and organizations are looking for new candidates. They're not at this time, and maybe even today, they're not necessarily looking at, at women. And if women put themselves forward, as you recount mm -hmm. in your book, they're, you face condescension, mansplaining, backstabbing, betrayals, all mm -hmm. these things are happening. 
in your memoir. There's a long catalog <laughs> of this uh, going on. And uh, you're, as you said, this is a different time period. You know, this is um, the 60s to the early 80s as you are, you know, going through your, your rise in political consciousness and then education and then this first step in your first uh, campaign. How did, you t how did you find the strength to put up with all this stuff? From I'm a very determined person. That's one thing. And I, get, I have a core, you know, and just like my mom, the, the, hence the title Heart of Fire. It relates to my mother, but I think she passed on some of that fire to me. I'm a very determined person. That doesn't mean that I'm, you know, shouting or being very vocal about it. But um, once I made up my mind, uh, I, I would just do it. So even running for lieutenant governor uh, is in Hawaii, the lieutenant governor runs his or her own race. The governor does not pick the running mate. Because if I had to wait around for that, there's no way any of the gubernatorial candidates would ever have picked me. I know for a fact. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> by that time, I had quite the reputation as a state legislator. Uh, so that, that I would not have been picked. So I ran. And that was a huge step for me mm -hmm. to do that. But that's what I mean about risk taking. That's one of the three life lessons I learned over my time with my mom and politics. One is one person can uh, make a difference. My mother changed my life by bringing me to this country. The second is uh, you, you, half the battle is showing up, meaning with determination. It's not, not, just, not just physically showing up, but emotionally being steady and determined. So half the battle is showing up. And the third is get out of your comfort zone and take some risks. And it certainly wasn't my comfort zone. I'm a very reserved person. Do you know that if probably if I didn't become a social worker or therapist, I would have loved to own a, um, a bookstore. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. have just sat there at a bookstore with a cat and right. <laughs> hope yeah. to have customers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. That sounds like a pretty ideal life for me as well. So we're going to get to that part of your personality in just a moment, but I want to follow up on something that was implied in what you were saying. Uh, you know, number one, obviously, it takes a lot to be a pioneer. It's one thing if there's already opportunities established so that you can just, you know, show up and something's <laughs> no. given versus you're, like you're saying, you have to actively put yourself forward into a place where people have no expectations for you. But one of the things that happened, I think you're being a little modest, is I think it's pretty hard to win a political election, but you, 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 you won several as a state legislator and then as a lieutenant governor, but then you lost. Yes. The whole string of successes. And then you, I believe you ran for governor and you yes. lost. So mm -hmm. what was that? I mean, obviously it sucked, I'm sure, but you it know, did. <laughs> <laughs> what, did you, what did you learn from that and how did you recover? Because obviously you did continue with your political career after that defeat. Running for governor was the hardest thing I've ever done much harder than running for U.S. House or even the Senate because uh, nobody expected me to win. Nobody expected me to even get past the primary. And the 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 what, what I would refer to as the the, the boys, the, the the usual people who got uh, involved in those kinds of races never supported me. So it was really hard emotionally draining. But at the end of it, I lost. Uh, but I don't. I, I I did not beat myself up about it because I had done everything I could against what I would consider pretty high odds to beat this woman. You know, the, this was that year, 2002, was a year of the women governor. There were 20 women who made it past our primaries. And so uh, there was an expectation that there would be all these women who would win office. There were four women who won office and one of them was the Republican who beat me, but she had run for governor four years before. So she had a lot of experience and a lot of support and paid staff that I didn't have. So what did I learn from that? You know what, many years later, uh, when, that night, by the way, when I lost, I told my husband and my mother, I think I have one big race left in me. I just don't know if I'll have another opportunity to do that. And you never know in politics because you can never line up all the ducks. You know, the ducks are never lined up. Nobody, I mean, you can never sit there and think, okay, when this happens, this happens, I'm going to run. No, it doesn't work like that. Certainly not for me. So I, I just, uh, I took that time though to restore myself and I returned to creating. Mm -hmm. And I had a good friend who does pottery. So I did ceramics with her and I continued to, to do that. And it was a, a return to the, uh, the, the love I have of art and I restored myself. Fortunately, my husband didn't expect me to cook or do any of that stuff. So that was good. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, I yeah. I have a very low maintenance husband. <laughs> <laughs> very important. <laughs> um, 
by the way, oh, yeah, you know, I have a lot of questions for Senator Hirono, so we, we have a lot, of, lots, a lot of stuff to talk about. For, for you in the <laughs> audience, you know, you are going to get your chance to ask questions. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that works. I think there's a chat window or something. You can put your questions <laughs> in there. We'll get to that in about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm sure you have a ton of questions for Senator Hirono as well. But let's go back to something that you had, you had also mentioned. Um, you know, which is that you in your other life you you might have owned a bookstore and just had this you know quiet life with your, your, your books. <laughs> And yeah. you know, you, 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 well, you do talk in your book about you know being either quiet or being perceived as quiet. Um, oh yes. That that you know people would look at you, see you as a woman, see you as Asian American, see you as an Asian yes. American woman. Then of course, there's all of these stereotypes, <laughs> expectations. That of are course. On you. And that was coming obviously from men. Um, I assume from Asian American men as well, but also from women. I mean, you, you recount one mm -hmm. incident. Once you uh, were a senator and you were underestimated by one of your senior uh, mm -hmm. colleagues who had more power than you and, and made assumptions about you and you had to speak up about that. So, you know, how is that? Is it, is it, is it fair to say that naturally you're a, a quieter person and then you had to, and you, I think you yourself characterize yourself as being a workhorse, not a show horse, at least yes. earlier in your, your career. Yes. So how hard was it for you to number one, be successful while having this so-called workhorse persona. And then how hard was it for you to break out of that and become you know, the firebrand senator <laughs> that we now uh, associate with? with In with the legislature, I, uh, I had a reputation of um, just really being very effective in what I was doing. And I did that by knowing more usually about the subject than the people around me. Uh, and so, um, I had a reputation as being a, a consumer crusader and also the ice queen because I wouldn't respond to some of the people who would, you know, say things to me. Uh, but I, nobody would take me for a pa uh, for for a uh, um, particularly a passive person in that arena. But let's face it: speaking out in the culture that I come from, which is uh, Hawaii, uh, we're we're all you know very much together and. Uh, being outspoken, aggressive, confrontational, uh, those are not uh, traits that are rewarded, uh, especially coming from a woman. So speaking out was not something that came easily to me. And I always thought that you had to be really, you know, articulate and all that kind of stuff, which I never, I don't bother with all that stuff so much anymore. But um, people, when you don't speak out, when, when you're not, when you don't speak in a, uh, what do we call the dominant culture, where uh, I think speaking is uh, rewarded. <laughs> Certainly it was in law school. Um, and when you're not that way, uh, people underestimate you. And for most of my political life, I have been underestimated. What changed was uh, that I can't, I hate bullies. And in Trump, we had the biggest bully of them all. And so one day, <laughs> uh, I, I had said when I became a Senator that I was going to do whatever communicating I would, I, uh, I would do with the media in Hawaii. And I didn't want to talk to the national press because I, one, I didn't feel comfortable. And two, I thought they would ask me all these gotcha questions. But Trump really created a, the environment for me to stand up to this bully. And I, the catalyst was uh, in, the, in the Congress, you have these things called sprays where all of the media people from print media and TV stations, everybody, they're all sort of there with their mics line and, and they wait at the end of a hallway where we're all passing, it's called a spray. And one day I stepped up to a spray because I was really upset with what Trump had said about my friend, Kirsten Gillibrand. He said that she had come to see him and was begging him for support and all that. And the innuendo it was so gross that I was very upset. And <laughs> so um, my communication director said, well, here's a spray, why don't you step up? So I did. And I think it was a surprise to a lot of them because that was the day I said that uh, you know, Trump is a misogynist, a liar, and an admitted sexual predator, and he will attack all of us. And the only thing that will save us is his resignation. And then I walked off. So that was kind of a surprise for them, but uh, I realized how important it was to speak up. And I've been doing that ever since. And as I say, with all the horrible things Trump was doing that if you don't speak up, uh, you're, you're just not uh, <laughs> doing your job. <laughs> well, you certainly got his attention. I believe there's a moment in the book where you're at some meeting and you introduce yourself to oh, the yes. president and he says, I know who you are. <laughs> so that's something like that, right? So he's you, called me names, yeah. you know? 
You got under crazy his skin. and stuff yeah. like that. Well, you know, he got under many people's skin. <laughs> I think it's only fair payback, you know, for someone like you to bother him as well. Well, as you said, I mean, the last quarter or third of your book turns towards the the years of the previous uh, administration. And, you know, we, we don't need to sit here and recount everything that mm-hmm. happened. I think everybody still has a pretty good memory of some of the mm-hmm. major events of the previous administration. And as you said, this was the a sort of a test for you that here was a real challenge um, that was going to test the soul of the nation <laughs> and <laughs> the soul of every politician in Washington, D.C. and outside of Washington, D.C., and you had been underestimated, but you had always had this uh, heart of fire, as as your as as the title of your book is, and you stepped up. You found you found that heart of fire, uh, or mm-hmm. you you let it show. Mm-hmm. My question: You don't have to name names. Is do you think you know politicians get their reputations made for history when history tests them? You know, some great event or great challenge happens. Do you think that every politician in just a democratic party rose to the occasion. This was a test for everybody. Do you think, you don't have to name names. I'm just wondering, do you think every politician rose to the occasion? I'd say pretty much the Democrats are together and wanting to do things that actually help people and not screw them over. So there's that. But I think the thing that's kind of different about me is for one thing, I look really different. (laughs) Um, Most of my Senate colleagues had never had to, had to uh, experience a, a, an Asian woman uh, colleague. They had had, you know, staff and all that, but never a colleague. So they, they there's that. And to uh, and so they had all their sort of their stereotypes and, and everything else. But I speak in a, what I call in a very plain way. And I just, it's not as I script all this. And when I tell men in this country, just shut up and step up, that was definitely not scripted, but I felt it at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I speak very plainly. And I think that is an important way to communicate. I think I I communicate in a way that's not flowery. That's not, you know, it it doesn't have all the rhetorical flourishes. And I admire my colleagues who can do that. That is not natural for me. And so I never learned the Senate speak. So I didn't have to unlearn it. And I just speak the way I, I'm, I convey, you know, I, I communicate. So that's it. Right. I didn't do it for the attention, by the way, Vin. Oh, it, I'm it, sure. It, it came, which was kind of surprising. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I assume every every politician has to negotiate a balance between the script, you know, whatever they have to say, versus authenticity, versus saying what they really believe, what they really feel. And it's all kinds of constraints, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, so you're, you know, like, there are moments in, in your memoir, uh, and of course, I've seen, you know, clips on video and, and tweets and so on, where you're very forceful in what you have said, um, espousing your position and your opposition to various kinds of policies. Uh, That just came out of some deep heartfelt moment of- Yes, (laughs) yes. How, 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 I mean, like I I, I know a lot of people who, who they're political, now not necessarily politicians, but they would never give vent to things that they really believe in because they're always making calculations about what the costs and the consequences are and all that kind of thing. Um, I just, I'm just curious about that part of your character. Like, where do you think that comes from? The willingness to, to, to speak out, um, knowing that there might be blowback, as there was blowback in some of the, to some of the things that you've said. I'm at the point where that kind of blowback, I, uh, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't stop me. And, and through my political life, uh, I, I, I have stood up to people, and I, I have a, a pretty sharp tongue. You know, <laughs> it would come out <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> So uh, it, most of the time I just worked hard, but there would always be times when people would be, in, they, they would be in my face and I just tell them, you know, um, back off. Yeah. I, I remember I told one state Senator uh, who was uh, asking, he, he had some problems with some bill that I was doing it. And I just looked at him and I said, I know more about this than you do. I said, just you step aside. And I just gave him a look. I used to scare people when I was in the legislature, <laughs> let's put it that way, <laughs> because I knew more about what I was talking about than a lot of them. I did my, I did my homework. Is it fair to say that, you know, you've always had this capacity to give the look, to do the work? Oh, yes. The <laughs> Is it fair to say that, that there, there was a change in you over time? I mean, it seems like the memoir is charting a change of you coming into 
a, a different way of expressing yourself. Yes. And I and call I, I call it becoming more my complete self, yeah. and to uh, use my voice. It's not that it's, it, it, there used to be stories like she's found her voice. No, I always had a voice. I just didn't have to use it as frequently. But uh, it's part of uh, what I do now, and I think. Um, it's becoming, it's been a long journey for me to be this way and uh, to uh, not spend a lot of time thinking about what the blowback might be because I have my detractors, believe me. Fox News, yeah, all the time, right? And, and there are those who, who are out there, but uh, I, I speak the way I really, I really believe and the, the, the circumstances and all of that. And I get enough feedback from people who just pre-COVID days Wherever I, I, I go, airports, New York City, people would just come up to me and, and uh, tell me they appreciate the, the way I just say things. You know, I think I'm the first senator to call the president a liar. I don't say, oh, he stretches the truth. No, he's a, he's a liar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's a misogynist. Mm -hmm. My yeah. goodness. Yeah, yeah. I, I've called him worse. And so, of course, yes. it's annoying to know that politicians who have the ear. I don't know that I can swear tonight, but, you know, I do swear. Oh, well, I, I can swear for you. I have some, I have some words in my, <laughs> in my question. But, you know, I'll, I'll follow your cue. But, um, you know, it's, it's obviously frustrating for many of us who are not politicians to, to yes. see that politicians won't, and, and the media sometimes, just won't say the word that actually mm -hmm. factually states what is yes. happening, right? Yes. So it's refreshing. Um, we have a bunch of questions. I want to ask you one last question, though, uh, uh, based on what I know from from the book that that other that that many of the, uh, many people in the audience may not know or may not remember, which is that as as, this, as all this was happening in in the uh, the previous administration, you fell ill. You you were diagnosed with um, stage four kidney cancer, I believe, and yes. had to undergo some surgeries, which involved removing your uh, one of your kidneys and also a rib. Um, yes. And so first of all, I mean, how are you doing? And then second of all, how was it to, to engage with this, you know, worst moment in American democracy while you were suffering all of these ailments? Tell you the truth, I, I just got, got on with it. It wasn't as though I'm patting myself on the back. I never had been hospitalized before. So here I am, suddenly, you know, I had to have these major surgeries and all that. And I had work to do. And, and so I just went, went on with it. However, it really made me realize. So when I got the bills for my surgeries, there's no way I could possibly have paid for any of that without at my age, Medicare, but uh, with health insurance. And that is why before the Affordable Care Act, a lot of the personal bankruptcies were due to unforeseen huge medical expenses. I, I, I almost fell over when I saw the, the, how much my rib surgery cost, for example. I'm still going to the doctor and I'm still you know, going through um, I, I am not what you call in remission quite yet, but it doesn't stop me. You know, I just, whatever co comes, I deal with it. <laughs> well, Senator, we, we all hope for the best for your, Thank for you. your, for your health. Um, let's turn to some questions from the audience. This is actually from Karen from Elliott Bay Books, a wonderful representative of, our, our, of, our, uh, of that bookstore. Thank you so much for your leadership. Could you name your top two or three priorities at the moment? And what can we do to support these efforts? And thank you for the signed mm -hmm. books. <laughs> We're still in the middle of a pandemic. And so we need to get our economy going. And that's why I very much support what President Biden is doing. Finally, we have a president who wants to take responsibility for getting this pandemic un under control and hence the vaccinations and, and all of that. Well, we, we have the, an economic crisis still because while Wall Street may be doing well, the rich people are doing fine. And the, there are a lot of people who are still out of work. And so uh, the, the next thing that uh, Joe Biden is putting forward is his, his uh, infrastructure plan, which will create jobs. So my goal is to help, uh, help Joe Biden do the kinds of things that we need to do to get our economy back, people back to work, including women, by the way, because they need childcare, they need all of that in order to get back to work. Millions of women have had to leave the workforce because of this pandemic. So there's a lot to do, not to mention, well, we need to pass the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act. You know, just one conviction does not erase the continuing uh, systemic racism and policing disparity in our country. We need to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act as we see hundreds of bills in so many states to suppress votes and basically steal people's votes. 
mainly the minorities and black communities votes and uh, climate change. So the, the, there are huge issues and, and, and we have just the, the hate crimes against Asians. And once again, the, the API community, Asian American Pacific Islander community seen as the other, the perpetual foreigners. And so it, it percolates, it's, uh, racism is never far below the surface in our country. And you have the Chinese Exclusion Act, you have the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II, you have the Muslim ban. And so we have to be eternally vigilant. But the, rate, the, the kind of hate crimes against AAPIs during this pandemic is uh, very damaging to all of us. I don't know a single Asian person who just walks around blithely, you know, thinking everything's gonna be fine. Really? Honestly, like I, I have stepped out my door to get my garbage can and, you know, a car will drive by. I'm in a nice neighborhood. I'm like, hmm, is this person going to roll down the window saying something to me? Yes. You know, it's getting very, I mean, it's like literally, I think everybody knows like one person and like there's only one degree of separation from hate crime incidents that yes. happen to people that I know. It's random and it's unexpected about what we should be aware, but these are totally unprovoked random acts of uh, animus right. against our community. Well, thank you. You actually sponsored uh, an act, a, a hate crimes act. I can't remember exactly yes. the title of the legislation. It's called the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. <laughs> right. And it passed in the Senate with like everybody except one dude. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, of course, the, I that guy. I'm surprised it wasn't two guys, you know. So, I know. I was, it, it, it was uh, kind of nice to see Ted Cruz, who had, who had an amendment, by the way, to basically gut the bill. <laughs> His amendment failed. Okay. And he voted for it. Well, okay, so, so I, I, I speak on this issue a lot, and then I always get the question, what can we do about anti-Asian hate? And I'm like, I'm just a writer. But Senator, you're a senator. What is involved in this act that you think is going to do something about this rising tide of anti-Asian hatred? This is a very, in my view, non-controversial bill. And what it does is ask, it asks the attorney general to appoint someone to rapidly review these, these crimes and then to work with local and state law enforcement to uh, uh, have them do an online reporting, enable online reporting of these crimes that are and incidents that are very, very underreported, and uh, to get to the community that's affected to tell them that you know these are things that we need to work on. So to create a database, and uh, we we also had an, a bipartisan amendment by Dick Blumenthal and uh, uh, the Rep Republican Senator Moran. Uh, to further um, enable, you know, more effective uh, gathering of information and so that we can do something more. But passing you know, this bill, well, I know that it doesn't mean that the hearts and minds of everybody will follow. Uh, and so the cultural changes, attitudinal changes, I think uh, there's an education component to it because who learns about things like the Chinese Exclusion Act or the internment of Japanese Americans. I didn't even learn about that until college. And the extreme racism and the lynchings in our country and the Jim Crow laws, all of those things need to be, uh, to be taught. And I also know that empathy, which is a really critical uh, aspect of any leader, it can be taught also. And those are some of the things. And then each of us has a voice. <laughs> we can speak out. And I, I, I've seen more APIAs on TV speaking out than I've ever seen in my entire life. So that's a good thing. Well, one of the things that, that you've also, I mean, we, we've been speaking out because of the anti-Asian violence and let's hope they speak out, about, speak out about other things. So it's one of the things that you did recently, you tweeted that uh, now that we've passed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, we also need to pass the George Floyd Policing Act. And I thought yes. that was really crucial, you know, these kinds of public, you know, uh, acknowledgements that we're mm -hmm. all in this together. You know, it's not just yes. that Asian Americans have to defend ourselves, but you know, we have to defend mm -hmm. everybody, including, you know, black people against uh, police violence and other forms of racist anti-black anti violence yes. as well. We've Very so, much so. Yeah, we, we, and, you know, we as an Asian American community have received a lot of support from black leadership and just, you know, every, you know black people, mm -hmm. uh, black activists, black organizations in this time as well. So I think it's really mm -hmm. crucial to, to articulate these kinds of positions publicly. So thank you for that. Now, another question from the audience, how has your immigrant experience changed the way you read new legislation? What are some things that stick out to you or that you look for when reviewing it and deciding uh, whether to support it or not? A lot of it has to do with it, whether it's gonna help the working people, or whether it's gonna help uh, 
Uh, but when we talk about comprehensive immigration reform, I wanna make sure that family unity is a guiding principle of immigration changes. And so uh, I, I really uh, fight for the, the people who don't have uh, much of a voice in the uh, decision-making process. And, and so I always look at, you know, how are consumers gonna be helped by whatever we're doing? And I certainly don't think that uh, a 1.5 trillion tax break for the richest corporations and people in our country was necessary and we should claw it back to pay for uh, the, the infrastructure, which will actually create jobs and long-term long benefits. So I look for those kinds of things. And, and, and especially, you know, one of the areas that I, I've spent time on is the, the sexual assault and sexual harassment of the military. It continues to be a scourge. And, and so those are some of the things that I bring a perspective of both as an immigrant and as uh, uh, their gender issues and, and as a woman. Right. Uh, a follow-up question from me on this issue. Uh, you know, part of the, when we talk about immigration, one of the things that happens is deportation. Uh, deportation of uh, many different people from different populations, but um, spe you know, speaking specifically about Asian Americans, a, a cause of concern for, for, for many mm -hmm. Asian Americans uh, is deportation of Southeast Asians, Vietnamese and Cambodians, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they came here at a very young age as because of the war and in, in Vietnam and Cambodia, and then did, did the wrong thing, got prison sentences, were, finished their time, and then literally hundreds have been deported back mm -hmm. to, a, to a country that they have no memory of and, and they mm -hmm. don't speak the language of. So why, I mean, like, okay, so <laughs> yep. what can you do anything to, to, to change the conversation on this or to- yes, uh, Well, I have uh, joined in a letter to President Biden to ask him to uh, stop that, to uh, create a much better uh, deportation policy because deporting people who committed crimes when they were younger, um, they've already paid, you know, they, they, they've already served their sentences. That is not what we need to be doing. And so I hope that he will reassess these deportations uh, may, uh, of so many Southeast Asians. And I hope that he will also increase the number of refugees who can come into our country because these are people who have already been vetted. Uh, and so I think he will make those kinds of changes. There's no question that uh, President Biden inherited a shredded immigration system with very little humanity in it. And he wants to create an immigration system that is uh, humane and it will take time. So mm -hmm. there, there are so many areas where uh, the, he needs to attend to in, in the immigration side. So I, um, I have hopes that he will reassess the deportations. Yeah, and, not, and not just Southeast Asians, I also think about, you know, Korean adoptees, for example, falling under the oh, yes. same category, you know, people brought over when they were infants, their parents never In got fact, uh, I have a home. bill with uh, Roy Blunt yeah. to uh, enable the Korean adoptees to uh, remain in our country, to, to uh, have citizenship. Right. Because for some reason that they, they were adopted by American families and somehow their citizenship didn't get changed. Yeah. So they're going to get deported. And, and so I have a bill to stop that. Good. Thank you. It's deeply unfair um, to these to these people who are, are, are here not out of any choice of their own. Mm -hmm. um, so related to this, there's a question about uh, collaboration or bipartisanship, working with other senators. It's being not a direct neighbor to another state. Who are the other senators that you work with most closely? And how does that uh, affect legislation that you introduce? Well, I clearly work with a lot of my Democratic senators and, and I do reach, reach out to my Republican colleagues and not necessarily on the big bills, but there are a lot of bills that they share certain interests. For example, uh, Joni Ernst, she has a lot of, uh, she has a rural area in Iowa. And, and so she and I worked on telemedicine for rural areas. I've worked with other Republicans. And in fact, I tell my staff that unless it's a bill that I know I'm not gonna get any Republican co-sponsors, I tell my staff to look for a Republican co-sponsor on, on all of these. We just don't get into a whole big discussion about how could you vote for, you know, to eliminate the Affordable Care Act or how could you not vote to impeach the president because they did what they did. So I try to find those things uh, that, are, um, that we can work on. 
So I guess the COVID-19 uh, hate crimes bill is is one glimmer of, of hope. You know, you've got 99% right. But I started off as yeah. a bill that I couldn't get a single Republican to co-sponsor it. Hmm. But it worked out. I, I worked very closely with Susan Collins yeah. Yeah. to work out the amendments. So there's a little bit of hope. Um, Okay, here's a question. Uh, is, is it a major challenge to be representing one of the states that is furthest away from DC? That's Hawaii. <laughs> In my view, every Senate seat is a national seat. Uh, and, and then yes, there are very specific things that relate to Hawaii that I pay attention to. There are very unique aspects to Hawaii. And so I, I do pay attention. So I don't know that it's particularly difficult uh, in that regard, because there are a lot of other states that, you know, they have their very unique uh, situations. Uh, and, and so uh, every Senate seat is a national seat. There are national issues that we all work on. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of stereotypes about Hawaii. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a national seat. It's, it's a part of the country, obviously, but there, there's still a lot of stereotypes about Hawaii that people <laughs> who are not from Hawaii have, obviously, the tourist fantasy of Hawaii for most uh, Americans outside of Hawaii, it only registers as a state in terms of a vacation destination or mm -hmm. a military uh, destination. Uh, is there something you want to tell, tell the audience like, about, about, about Hawaii uh, that the rest of the country needs to know about the state? Well, Hawaii is uh, one of the leaders in uh, getting away from reliance on fossil fuels. So we have a very ambitious goal of, uh, of totally uh, producing our own electricity by 2045. And now Hawaii was probably the most fossil fuel dependent state in the entire country. We were importing over 95% of the energy we use for electricity is sending billions of dollars out of, out of our state. And so we are a leader in uh, alternative and renewable energy. So that's one thing that people don't know about very much about Hawaii. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, besides tourism, there are things that, that, that we do in Hawaii. <laughs> I know, I know, I know there are, but you know, again, yes. um, Americans are not <laughs> But that's really... one, that's one of the areas I'd say that we are a leader. Yeah, we're not really geographically knowledgeable <laughs> to the United States. Okay, you know, another question about Hawaii. Is Hawaii's population more mixed race than most other states in the country? And how do you see that impacting the way racism might play out there? Or conversely, I'll add, how does that change things for the better if it does? There's no dominant racial group in Hawaii. So there's no racial group that's over 50%. That leads to people being much more cooperative and we do intermarry more than I would say any other state. If you come to Hawaii, you will hardly see any child that is not of mixed race, which is really beautiful. And in fact, when the Kids from Hawaii used to come and visit me in Washington, D.C., and they would all be all mixed races, you know? And I'd say, look, there's only one person who looks like you in the Senate, and you're looking at her, and they would go, oh, you know, because we're, we're used to really appreciating other cultures. And yes, that helps, that helps a lot. I'm so grateful that I represent a state where uh, we don't have the kind of overt racism if they have racist notions, they kind of, they tend to keep it to themselves. Although once in a while, somebody might yell at me, go back where you came from. But they sort of keep it to themselves more. And, and we, you know, aloha spirit is not just words. We do try to live up to it. So I represent a state where people care about each other and, you know, the wearing of masks and, and the social distancing and all that. I mean, we're just as frustrated as anybody else, but I think there's much more compliance because there is a, this, attitude that we have of ohana, which is to take care of not just of our own family, but others. Uh, hard to believe that anybody would live in Hawaii who would say stuff like, go back to where you came from, <laughs> I guess, uh, in, you know, in, in everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, question from the audience. Hearing of your early years starting in politics has been a pleasant surprise, yet in your campaigns these years of the 1960s to 1980s of activism don't seem to be publicized. Was this intentional strategy? No, not at all. I, I ran my first race in 1980. So uh, when I ran in 1980 in this tiny little district, the concerns were much more relevant to the district. So it wasn't as though everybody had to know that I was an anti-war protester. It's when I, when I ran for national race that it became more 
of, of telling more of my, my story. And clearly when I ran for statewide office, more people began to uh, be aware that I was an immigrant. There were, all through high school, I don't think anybody knew I was an immigrant or I had the kind of background that I had. Um, okay, here's another question from the audience. To add on to the discourse of race in Hawaii, how are you representing the needs of indigenous Hawaiians? I am uh, very much uh, in support and I fought for Native Hawaiian education, housing and healthcare. Those are all under attack by some people who do not consider Native Hawaiians and indigenous people. They think that all these, the Congress has passed over 150 laws that, that benefit Native Hawaiians. And we have a trust responsibility, but there are a lot of people in the house and in the Senate who think that all of these laws are race-based and therefore unconstitutional. So there are all these efforts all the time, especially when I was in the house, they would try to deauthorize, defund all of these programs that are really important for Native Hawaiians. So I have been a champion on all of these issues and I very much respect uh, the Native culture, the Indigenous culture that is a very much part of parcel of how we treat each other. So the idea of aloha and ohana comes from the Native Hawaiian community. And they have uh, specific issues that relate to their culture and the protecting of their culture, and it is really important that that those concerns are um, are addressed early on in a process. It's not a situation where you tell the Native Hawaiian community here, "This is what we're going to do with this land." No, that that's not how it should be. So, so uh, the Native Hawaiian community ha is, is uh, they have definitely uh, got a voice in what happens because you know we had a monarchy. People don't know that. Uh, Hawaii was a monarchy. We had a kings and queens, and they had treaties with all kinds of countries, including the United the, the United States. And then uh, there was an overthrow with the United States being complicit in 1893. They overthrew the the queen, and so they, you know they, they, when Hawaii became a state, uh, a trust relationship was created. But we don't have the Native Hawaiians do not have a political relationship with the United States as do the Alaska Natives and American Indians. And that is why all these laws that support Native Hawaiians can be subject to lawsuits. And there have been, there have mm -hmm. been quite a few mm -hmm. lawsuits. So we have to be ever vigilant. Yeah. Um, and yes, hopefully now with Deb Harlan being the, uh, the Secretary of the Interior, we're gonna see some uh, responses yes. as well. Uh, to yes. indigenous movements, um, both you know the national the, the the movement for sovereignty in Hawaii, and then also of course, native um, political movements and environmental movements, and in, in mm -hmm. the rest of the forty eight states also. Yes. Let's end with a couple of questions about important women in your life. Um, Patsy Mink, you mentioned her quite often in in the memoir. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure everybody knows who who Patsy Mink is, but maybe mm -hmm. tell us uh, who she is and why she was important to you. Patsy Mink was a, a trailblazer, and so. Uh, uh, I very much respected her and, and, and we were friends. And the sad thing was that when she got sick, um, the last time I saw her was a 4th of July parade in uh, 2002. Uh, and I was running for governor um, at that time. And she had, she invited me to have lunch with her. And she just looked at me, here's a woman who had run for the US Senate and Danny Noe in the US House. Uh, at a time when Danny Noe was running, so he won. She ran for U.S. Senate, Senate Spark Matsunaga won. She ran for mayor. She ran for, for governor. She just kept picking herself up. You know, and there was this hiatus period when she was not in the U.S. House where she was the first woman of color ever to be elected to Congress. So she, she truly was a... Um, somebody that was very inspiring to me. But it, at the same time, she was really unto herself. So although she was a lawyer, I didn't think of myself as being able to follow in those footsteps. But I'm glad that over time I got to know her. And, and she told me when she had lunch with me, she looked at me uh, and said, you just have to win, you just have to win. And in that statement was all of the, the races that she had run where the guys just basically didn't support her. Even though, even though she was obviously very qualified. Mm -hmm. Another strong woman in your life is your mother. You, you begin and end the book with, with your mother. Maybe tell us some more about her as a way of, of ending our, our conversation tonight, Senator. My mother was so 
uh, different in that I would do things that was not expected, like the time when I went to live in Waimanalo for one summer. And uh, I just kept doing different things in the politics, working at the legislature. And that was a part-time job to the point where my older brother, who was very uh, focus and he was working from a very young age and he stayed with the same company until he retired. Yes, my mother went, when is Maisie getting a real job? <laughs> so I, I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with myself. And I, I just didn't think that politics was going to be it. And it's always in, in a way, it's a surprise to me that I have been able to do this and to be an advocate and to, and to be a fighter for this long. But I, I, I never think of what I do as a career. Because what kind of a career is it that you got to run for office every two years, four years, or six years, and somebody can they can kick you out? That's not a career. I call it my service. <laughs> well, thank you for your service, Senator. It's been a delight talking to you and discussing your memoir, Heart of Fire. You can get it obviously here, uh, the Elliott Bay Books, and I believe Candace is going to usher us out. Yeah. Thank you so much, Fit. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Uh, this has been a really fun conversation to listen to. It's great hearing your story. And I know for Seattle, I'm kind of new here, but a lot of people are from Hawaii, mm. uh, moved here from there or vacation there certainly quite often. Um, so it's also really fun to just hear. A lot of them go to Wash U. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have luau's at Wash U. <laughs> oh, so good. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Um, I want to thank the audience as well. Thank you so much for all of your questions. Uh, the book link is in the chat. So please go to Elliott Bay um, to purchase a copy of uh, Senator Hirono's book um, and support a local store. Um, we'd love to have you both in person when that is possible. But <laughs> until then, um, I hope that you stay safe and have a great night. Everyone, aloha, stay safe, be kind. Thank you so much, Yet It's it was a privilege to chat with you. A lot of fun, Senator. Well, hopefully we'll do it in person one day. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Aloha.